Sarita at King's College. Uh, after she finished her PhD, uh, she joined uh, Kytogenics Pharmaceuticals and then joined the School of Pharmacy in Cardiff. She then moved to Imperial Chemistry with the Royal Society uh, Dorothy Hodgkins uh, Fellowship, and now she's at King's. So, Perfect. Maya, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being uh, invited in this amazing uh, meeting, and I'm very happy to be with a uh, great uh, of London nanotechnology. And uh, so I'm Maya Thanu, and uh, I'm a uh, course part of the London Centre for Nanotechnology. My lab is Nano Lab. It's not small, it's big for London. And uh, uh, today I want to highlight only one property of mine. I'm a trustee in the British Society of Nanomedicine and I would like to invite everyone that participates in this meeting to become a member of this amazing society because we promote nanomedicine in UK and we stand for you uh, in Europe as well. So this is uh, actually my main property that I would like to promote today. So um, apart from that, I would like to share with you my research and my research focus that it is very, very focused. It's focused ultrasound trigger the drug delivery or focused hyperthermia. So, but these needs imaging and of course the smart nanoparticles. Without the nanotechnology, without the nanoparticles, these amazing technologies would never have such impact. So what is MRI guided focus ultrasound? MRI guided focus ultrasound is a amazing magic technique. I mean, it's called the surgery without the knife. And in fact, what it does is concentrating ultrasound transducers, all the ultrasound beams in one location. I mean, they just go through an acoustic lens and they concentrate their energy in uh, tiny areas of three millimeter in diameter. So this way they can heat, they can ablate, they can interact with other materials that they are present there. Therefore, we can make our treatments very, very focused, very targeted, and of course, imageable. So we can see them and now we can have all the right um, modification under control. The imaging also uh, is helped by the feedback of the MR thermometry and uh, uh, due to resonance proton frequency shift. It's a very standard technique that it is combined mainly with MRI. So uh, some of the achievements of the MRI uh, guided focus ultrasound, particularly recently in the brain. And now with MRI guided focus ultrasound, we can locate the very tiny areas in the brain, and that's very preferable for the tumor uh, pass for the glioblastoma. And uh, we can affect the permeability of the uh, blood brain barrier or blood to tumor barrier at only on location, on that location that it is targeted. This is occurring via mediators like bubble or the recently developed phase shift uh, nano droplets that they uh, expand and they cavitate and they make uh, um, little hole spores in the blood brain barrier that allow the permeation of molecules only in that location. And for example, in the upper part that was published a few years ago, we can see in the center one tiny bright spot. Well, this is the gadolinium contrast uh, enhancement agents that pass through only in that area. Of course, the image guided the drug delivery is a, is a primary, is first on the list of the MRI guided focus ultrasound or the ultrasound guided focus ultrasound, like from a work published in radiology from our colleagues in Oxford, where they managed to enhance the release of the drugs from thermosensitive liposomes in the liver tumors, and that was really exciting. They used ultrasound guidance, I will forgive them, but I will show you how we can make it better or more specific mainly with uh, MRI guidance. So what we are doing, we are making the liposomes and Nazilla, thanks to Nazilla, she, she made the very nice lipid imaging lipids that we are using and we are expanding, we're modifying, we are modulating, and then we are continuing this work. So these liposomes can be um, um, encapsulate, can encapsulate drugs, they can be seen in MRI, and when the MRI locates the liposomes in the tumor, focus ultrasound is applied only in the tumor, and we cause the release of the drug only in the tumor. Now, if we take this under consideration and we can combine with the proper pharmacokinetics, then we can have a good and targeted, targeted triggered treatments. So, in order to, um, to have to look to deliver the drug only in the tumor, we just use the imaging and the activation method, like a remotely controlled 
release of the drug in the tumor only, while the rest of the drug is designed in such a way to leave quickly the body. Okay, so uh, the liposomes are um, just normal liposomes. We can uh, encapsulate drugs via pH gradient and uh, we can release the drug sharply uh, at the 42 degrees. This, um, this technology is called this mainly old technology from the light using the lysolipids or the thermosensitive low temperature critical solution um, lysol, uh, liposomes well, that they do uh, have um, the property of uh, become uh, make, giving the fluidity in the lipid membrane at 42 degrees. The rest of the uh, liposome is uh, decomposed at that point, and uh, whereas below that uh, temperature, below the 42 degrees, the liposomes are integer and intact, and they contain the drug without releasing it in the circulation. So in order to make it to demonstrate that, so it just a moment, yeah. Here, we uh, designed a number of in vitro studies to identify, first of all, if the nanoparticles can be seen via the MRI-guided focus ultrasound. And we can see here, this is a screenshot of the MRI-guided focus ultrasound, the exablate, and uh, that it is at Samaris, it was on Samaris. And we made those liposomes containing doxorubicin, and we made the phantom gel in the 96 well plate format, and we located the energy of the ultrasound in one tiny uh, well, and we managed to increase the temperature at for a few degrees from 37 to 42, and we release the drug locally in that location only. Now, the temperature increase absolutely controlled. This is a cross section at the upper level. It's a cross section how the temperature is increased. In solution, the drugs again uh, behave like standard thermosensitive liposomes, meaning that when the temperature is increased again from, uh, 40, from 37 to 42, the drug is released at 100%. And uh, we can monitor that by the fluorescence because uh, we select drugs that they are quenched inside the AQ score, but the fluorescence is recovered when they are released at uh, the physiological pH. And of course, this is just by heating up the solution. Whereas here, what we can see is that we can uh, induce this release by focus ultrasound. So we incorporated these liposomes within uh, the, the gel and we focus the ultrasound only in one location. So we can see the topotecan, which is a brilliant uh, quencher and uh, recovers the fluorescence in a very nice way. We can see that there is no um, uh, no fluorescence when the focus ultrasound is off, but fluorescence when the ultrasound is on, and particularly at a certain um, power and a certain duty cycles, of course, it's related to that. I mean, doxorubicin has the same effect. I mean, whereas within the, at a slightly different wavelength, it is quenched inside, and when it is released by focus ultrasound, then we recover the fluorescence. Um, but we wanted to test all this in vivo in animals, and uh, for this particular reason, we made these thermosensitive liposomes labeled for near infrared labels, and we uh, incorporated uh, the, the drug topotecan in order to monitor this in uh, real uh, um, animals. So here we can uh, look, identify that the focus ultrasound, uh, that the heat, sorry, induced the release. Uh, of the drug, and this is, for example, at the, um, at the left, I mean, an unheated tumor, whereas at the right, we have an heated tumor where the green fluorescence of topotecan is recovered and diffused all over the tumor. So, hyperthermia and focus ultrasound and other uh, interventions of this type, they have an amazing um, effect on tumor blood vessels and on tumors in general. So, they do promote chemotherapy effect. Okay. So further, in, uh, we tested in the uh, animals that they bear two tumors. They have two tumors, left and right. They are at the flanks, and we uh, inject the liposomes intravenously in the tail vein, but we apply the focus ultrasound only on the right tumor. 
And uh, this can uh, demonstrate that the particles are uh, highly uh, rapidly accumulated in the tumors, whereas the drug is rapidly released only in the tumor side. And we can monitor, we can see a surprising effect that the lipid, the magenta is for the li lipid in the liposomes, whereas the green is for the drug, the lipid remains in the tumor for substantially prolonged time. And we decided to take this to our advantage in the later study, as I will show. So, what about if it is a remotely controlled release method? What about if we repeat this method? If we can have, if we can induce the uh, ultrasound drug release repeatedly? I mean, this is happening instantly, and only with very few minutes of focus ultrasound treatment, we can have a hundred percent release of the liposomes that they are just passing by from the tumor. So, and again, I mean, what? we can observe here. I mean, the liposomes do accumulate only in the focus ultrasound treated tumor, whereas the other tumor has minimum accumulation and the drug is released every time we apply the focus ultrasound in a short period of time. So it's again like zapping the tumors and we release the drug locally. Um, okay, is it effective? Can we achieve maximum dose to uh, affect the tumors? We decided to test this in triple negative breast cancers, and uh, we uh, did the whole thing of development. So first of all, we decided to test that it is safe. Then uh, the particles were uh, tested for gadolinium leakage because all the other materials are uh, uh, lipids and accepted as safe. And uh, uh, the drug is the chemotherapeutics. So um, in this case, we can see that there is no leakage from, from the daughter head group, uh, not only in water or in serum, as well as um, the against EDTA conditions that uh, through um, diffusion membrane um, area. So, I mean, so we were co quite confident that this uh, gadolinium, that the gadolinium is not leaking out of the liposomes and serum conditions, EDTA conditions over two days. So that was quite good, encouraging to proceed to the development. The development. The next point we wanted to test is if the particles, if these liposomes are stable enough, because if they are not stable or they are not the same as at the moment that we prepare them, then we will have a problem in the translation and down the line. So again, we decided to choose all the materials from safe, safe materials and previously tested in humans. So at room temperature, it behaves the same for, the, for 24 hours, but surprisingly, and but thank God, I mean, this was behaving the same over two months. So it had the same release profile and the same size and the same characteristic uh, for uh, over two months storage at four degrees. So again, that was quite encouraging. Um, the pharmacokinetics, that's uh, for the for the uh, clearance. And we can, again, I have to highlight, we select the pharmacokinetics. We designed these particles to be rapidly cleared out of the body, I mean, quickly, within a few hours, in order to avoid the exposure of the drug to, or long exposure of the drug to the healthy tissues. And uh, uh, the doxorubicin is rapidly clearing, and the same happens to the gadolinium lipid and all tested with a nice metal detection techniques and I'm very um, thankful to these techniques because we have reproducible data in this kinetics of uh, gadolinium. Um, and for the doxorubicin loaded thermosensitive liposomes, we saw the same effect where the doxorubicin is released only in the tumor that it is treated uh, with a focus ultrasound. So we confirmed that we the, these particles behave and release the drugs remotely uh, and non-invasively. I mean, in, uh, on the tumor, on the right tumor. And uh, this effect caused uh, necrosis and apoptosis of uh, the tumor as we it was uh, detected using the uh, annexin in vivo uh, probe. So again, the right tumor has been uh, treated with ultrasound, allowed the drug to be released and allowed the drug to be active. So um, the effects on the tumor size, again, for triple negative breast cancer, the no treatment uh, and uh, is, has no effect. Doxorubicin has no effect. 
our formulation with doxorubicin at four milligram per kilo equivalent dose has a substantial uh, an inhibition of the tumor growth and a very good effect on the animal survival. Now, compared to doxil or dox, the what was recommended dose and dosing from the literature, this formulation behaves much better because it delivers the drug only at the, at the, the tumor and also the rest of the drug is clearing out of the body. So we have some advantages. This is why with much guided drug delivery, we have some advantages of controlling the drug disposition mainly in the tumor. And this is very, very important for chemotherapeutics or other macromolecules that they require specific location uh, targeting. We don't have any receptor targeting uh, because it is the, the regional targeting is much more effect. We managed to deliver the drug several times from 10 to 100 uh, times more in the tumor, so we don't have the selectivity of the receptor. That could be another point that we will have to consider, but particular for certain tumors. Now, the oops, this is a bit slow here. And just to compare the left and the right tumor, we can see that uh, no, no ultrasound, no drug, the tumors are growing. Uh, with drug and ultrasound, without ultrasound, we ha still have an effect on the, on the tumor because of the liposomal toxorubicin, but the major effect occurs when we combine the ultrasound with these particular uh, uh, nanoparticles. And the guy here uh, completely eliminated the tumor in this case. Now, um, the next question, can we see them by MRI? So we injected the particles, now in this case, no ultrasound, just to monitor their accumulation in the tumors. And we were surprised to see, not surprised, I mean, it was as expected to uh, that the particles are accumulated in the tumor over time. And uh, they show very nice kinetic and indicating that these particles can be monitored by MRI and MRI guided focus ultrasound or any other technique that combines MRI and triggering or MRI and hyperthermia. So, Okay, the next challenge was a crazy idea. Can we deliver two drugs? And that was a little bit challenging. So now we have decided to incorporate one of the drugs in the lipid. You remember from the previous slide that the, some of the lipids remained in the tumor for some, some prolonged time. So we wanted to confirm if that lipid was a drug, and like lipidic drug, could it have a good effect if it was delivered with focus ultrasound? So we incorporated lesson 38, a very lipophilic drug in the membrane and carboplatin in the core. It was a pain, of course, I mean, it is very hard formulation, but uh, we managed to have a substantial amount of carboplatin in the core and substantial um, and a lot of SN38 in the membrane. So how does it look regarding the efficacy? Of course, we did all the other things, stability, release, et cetera, et cetera. So we, and then we injected this in, uh, in mice. And we, to our surprise, this formulation managed to inhibit the tumor growth, again in triple negative breast cancer, at practically one tenth of the dose of carboplatin and one fifth of the liposomal SN38. So, uh, so it inhibited the tumor growth and then actually it was administered only once, whereas in some other papers, this one 10 times for higher carboplatin and five times uh, higher liposomal SN38 are administered every two days or every other days. So we were able to achieve a significant uh, tumor growth inhibition with much lower uh, at the cancer drug dose. And this is why this technique can be um, can promote the delivery of the drugs uh, in a safe way. Maybe we can overcome a number of adverse effects of these anti-cancer agents. Uh, yes, I mean, there is much longer survival of the, uh, of the animals that they were treated. And uh, uh, likewise, I mean, uh, we were very happy to see that these animals lost actually no weight. Why? Because SN38 was not released in the circulation and carboplatin was not released in the circulation. Another surprising effect was that uh, the, um, with this formulation, we managed to um, see an extraordinary phenomenon, like when we apply the ultrasound, these particles are accumulated more in the tumor and less to the liver. 
So in fact, the liver to tumor ratio is changing. Whereas if we don't apply the focus ultrasound, they're circulating in nanoparticles, they're accumulating even more to the, uh, to the liver. Again, it's an element of, can we control the distribution of the particles over time? That would be very important for, uh, for, uh, for, the, um, for the treatment of these tumors. Okay, so that was it actually with the thermosensitive nanoparticles, but this, the technology of ultrasound is exciting and there are other materials that they are in development and very promising for, uh, for to be combined with the focus ultrasound. So focus ultrasound is combined with bubbles at the moment, but bubbles have very short half-life. Uh, so what we are doing is, uh, and some other groups, they try to condense this bubble to very small particle size, like nanotroplets, they are called. And these nanotroplets, they change phase. So when they are, they have inside the core, they have perfluorocarbon, they have a liquefied gas, and it is surrounded by, uh, by lipids. And when it is under the influence of ultrasound, of uh, uh, low intensity now, ultrasound, these nanotroplets expand and they become bubbles. Now, as bubbles, they are able to cavitate and induce um, induce the the effect so i mean we prepare this nanotroplet by lipid formation we incorporate the perfluorocarbon we characterize them um, and uh, we uh, we uh, use them to affect the cavitation now here we can see maybe the in this uh now we have droplets in this in this tube and we apply ultrasound and they start to expand and cavitate and with uh, this uh, high speed camera we were able to catch the cavitation this is 5 million frames per second and as you can see the droplets expand and we were going to take this under consideration to our advances for drug delivery to the brain in this case moving from the ultrasound how will just have few minutes only for uh, the microwave technology, which is an incredible technology. Uh, again, not fo as focused as yet, but the combination with materials, nanomaterials is uh, an exciting. So the microwave imaging and sensing is based on the difference on the dielectric constants of tissues. It's non-ionizing radiation, it's very safe and it's very cheap. But also, it is not, does not do only imaging, but it does also hyperthermia. So we have a setup in our laboratory, and we can see that here, for example, if this is a breast, that is phantom, of course, not a real breast, but we can locate the tumors. And uh, what uh, the the difference in a breast uh, tumor to the rest of the tissues is 10 to 1. So again, we are talking about the microwave contrast. This is very exciting field and very, uh, very uh, safe and cheap. The devices are like that. So ideally, the breast would be inserted in a, a surrounded by antennas that they would uh, detect the, uh, the difference in the dielectric constant. We tested this first material, the carbon nanotubes, because they are characterized by high conductivity. Uh, we, we are not so fun of the nanotubes. I think Kulud is more fun of the nanotubes. Um, but we wanted to test because they are, it's a very, for regarding their dielectric properties and conductivity, they are super. They are the best. So and indeed, we were able to monitor the contrast. So here, this is the tumor phantom, whereas the upper part is the, the multi-walled nanotubes. And it was important to have them slightly functionalized as well. Oops, sorry. And um, this is the type of the images or the type of maps we can get for phantoms, tumor phantoms. Uh, we want to substitute the, my, the nanotubes with more safe materials like the zinc oxide or zinc ferrites or iron oxide nanoparticles. And I'm very happy by the uh, talk by Professor Pankhurst earlier. And um, the zinc oxide nanoparticles, they also give equivalent contrast enhancement compared to the nanotubes and they are safer. And not only that, they give a concentration dependent enhancement of the contrast. And eventually what we want, we want to develop a series of nanomaterials of high dielectric con constant that they would, could, could operate as a microwave contrast enhancing agents for imaging and sensing, as well as absorbers, microwave absorbers to enhance locally the increase of the temperature to, to work again with hyperthermia. And if we have local hyperthermia, then we can deliver our thermosensitive liposomes to deliver the drug only there. 
So conclusions, I think I'm okay in time. Um, we have, uh, uh, we're making image guided focus ultrasound that it uses drug delivery, uh, drug release from theranostic liposomes, from image guided liposomes. We add MR labels and near infrared probes uh, coupled to lipids, and then we have dual modality. Uh, Short-term intervention, focal intervention improves the nanoparticle distribution in tumors. And microwave imaging and hyperthermia is an emerging technology that can offer imaging and hyperthermia method applied for image guided drug delivery. We wrote a book about all these stories uh, published by the Royal Society of Chemistry. I'm thankful to my team and to a number of people that they have given money. And I have to disclose that I made, uh, I'm a co founder of two companies. One is the AJ Medicaps that makes a colorectal cancer detection method with ingestible sensors, and Apicon that it is based on the thermosensitive uh, liposomes. And it is the beginning of these two startups. Hopefully, we grow uh, bigger. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm done. Oh, thank you very much, Maya. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Nazila, see your hands up. Yeah, actually, um, I had a question, please. A really nice, interesting talk, Maya. I really enjoyed this. Um, I guess I have a quick question, maybe a bit of a fundamental question about your biodistribution. Uh, when you mentioned with the focus ultrasound, um, you, you, you mentioned that the um, the liposomes have almost like tumor homing uh, uh, spatial temporal abilities when they are when you use the focus ultrasound, but then they uh, and also they they have more um, less liver accumulation. I'm just failing to see how that works because sure. from my understanding, when you inject a liposome IV, it will distribute everywhere, and with the focus ultrasound, you're releasing the drug um, specifically in situ rather than directing where it accumulates, the liposome accumulates. Perfect. Nazila, the ultrasound and any type of hyperthermia will enhance the, the fenestra of the blood vessels of the tumor from 200 nanometers to one micrometer. Okay, so it's not only that we release the drug, but we enhance the extravasation. We yeah. have uh, seen quantum dots, they extravasate more. All the nanoparticles, even non thermosensitive particles, they are extravasate more. So it's not only that we enhance the release, but we, we cause the release, we trigger the release, but we enhance the extravasation in the tumor. So now what happens is because the particles are still circulating, we are at the upper part of the clearance curve. Yeah. So it is a very high concentration. Every time we apply the focus ultrasound, it's, or every time we heat the tumor, it's like we tr we allow these doors to open, so more liposomes is getting out. If more liposome is getting out from the circulation, the less is going to the liver. Fantastic. And have you explored targeting? Maybe I missed that, ligand targeting. No, we did, and uh, we did incorporate the folate. It went everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was liver and everything. And we said, OK, maybe we better understand first without any ligand. And we incorporate the ligand at the second stage where it is going to be needed. Sure. Thank you very much, Maya. Uh, Quentin, do you have a question? Uh, <clears throat> yes, please. Um, very nice talk, uh, Maya. Um, with acoustic cavitation, I, I've heard a bit about this with the micro bubbles. Where, where the bubble collapses, I, I seem to recall that there's a lot of energy in that. If you're doing a similar thing with your liposomes, aren't they going to sort of just be destroyed? This is what we want, exactly. So the liposome, it's not liposome, it's nano droplets, yeah? Yeah. They yeah, yeah. whisper fluorocarbon inside and they expand, they become bubbles, and then yes. they explode the same way. But if the explosion happens, in the lesion, in the tumor, then you have like burst of the drug only locally. I see, but do you think you might get mechanical damage as well? In the tumor, we don't care. Okay. So mechanical damage, I mean, if it is because it is lo located, it is focused. Got it. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so for the ultrasound, are the, are the nano uh, bubbles necessary for the hypothermia or are they two separate things? Two separate up? things. Two separate things. For the cavitation, you don't need the um, the hyperthermia. Yeah. And and what's the sort of the tissue penetration depth of the ultrasound compared to you know light? Brain. 
brain, inside the brain, liver. I mean, it goes through in your body. Mm. And is it is it sort of focused in terms of you know resolution? You know, what sort of area is? You know. A three millimeter to one centimeter is the minimum focus that you can have. Cool. Cool. Thanks, Maya. Uh, are there any other questions? Oh, there's a question in the chat, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you read it? Yeah. Are you able to monitor drug release in vivo? Yes. I mean, the Topotecan and Toxorubicin was released in vivo and we were monitored with the near infrared fluorescence camera. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Maya. That was that was a brilliant talk. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so um, next up uh, we have uh, Asha Patel. Hi. Uh, hey, hey. So Asha Patel was a lecturer in cell and gene therapy in the National Heart and Lung Institute at Imperial. Uh, she graduated from King's College in 2006. Uh, in 2014, she was awarded a PhD uh, in the University of Nottingham under the guidance of uh, Chris Denning, uh, Morgan Alexander and Martin Davies. Then she joined Imperial in 2018 after four year uh, postdoc training in the labs of uh, uh, um, Daniel Anderson and Rob Langer in the MIT. Uh, Asha, over to you. Thank you. Let me try and uh, share this. Okay, just let me know if you can't see my slides. Um, thank you for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to talk today. It's my first talk with this community and hopefully I'll be able to um, meet some of you in person one day. Um, so I'll be talking about um, my work on the delivery of messenger RNA um, uh, applied to uh, lung disease. Um, I just started my lab, as you said, um, late 2018. So I'll be presenting a combination of work I did during my postdoc um, and uh, early lab work that I've started um, in my own group. So I thought I would uh, give some background into why we're interested in messenger RNA. Um, there's a lot more, I guess, that people know now from the recent approvals in um, mRNA-based medicines. Um, but we're interested because uh, we can synthesize mRNA in vitro um, and it can encode for any uh, protein of interest. Um, so if you look at this central um, dogma um, of DNA to mRNA to um, a protein, uh, we can see that mRNA can be translated in the cytosol rather than uh, being transcribed in the nucleus like the DNA. And so we think that we can um, get better um, translation in non-dividing cells, which is uh, particularly interesting for differentiated cell types that are quite hard to transfect. Um, we also think that the, you know, in the past decade, um, there's been real um, improvements in the stability of messenger RNA and the immunogenicity, which has uh, hindered its use, use in the past. Um, and especially with the recent approvals, um, there's a lot of excitement in terms of where else can we now go with uh, messenger RNA. So I'm particularly inter interested in, in chronic disease applications where you may want to deliver this more than once and where you can really take advantage of the transient property of mRNA where you may not want it to um, produce this protein for a long time. It could be for um, you know, inflammatory conditions where you want to deliver an anti inflammatory cytokine um, for a short amount of time or during um, epithelial cell repair um, where you may want to deliver growth factors and these um, these types of conditions are common in chronic lung diseases where um, in conditions such as asthma and IPF there is this dysregulated wound repair and and inflammation a pro-inflammatory environment um, however the two major um, aspects that are kind of um, hindering the application of mRNA are delivery vectors, especially for delivery to non-liver organs, um, such as the lung, um, and then also the pharmacokinetics of mRNA. So how much protein is produced from our mRNA transcript um, and how long is it produced for? And can we have real control over these aspects so that it can be like a, a you know a really useful drug um, rather than using the protein. Another um, interesting thing about messenger RNA is that it's um, you know it can encode for many diverse proteins but the basic properties of the mRNA can remain um, similar in that it's a negatively charged um, 
biomolecule. So my lab is interested in um, different aspects concerning the delivery of mRNA. Um, on one hand, we're looking at materials for messenger RNA delivery. We're very focused on non-viral vector um, approaches and um, we have um, developed polymers for its delivery. Um, another aspect is the nucleic acid engineering. So this is a, a basic um, mRNA um, transcript here. Um, and the UTR or the untranslated regions are quite interesting in that it can control um, the amount of mRNA that is produced and how long it's produced for. Um, the capping and the tailing of these constructs, um, there's been a lot of research in that in the past, and that's kind of what's made um, mRNA more stable. And, and you can use these for MR, um, vaccine applications now. And then finally, it's the um, administration of mRNA, the different um, delivery routes that we can use. Um, how does that affect distribution? Um, can we target cell types that we're interested in? And I'll be talking about inhaled and intravenous routes um, today. So I thought I would just mention um, the recently approved RNA-based medicines. So hopefully most of you have heard about these mRNA-based vaccines. Um, and also, um, maybe most of you um, also know about the siRNA based medicines that were approved um, late 2018, um, early 2019. Um, and I'm just mentioning these because they are, you know, up and coming RNA based medicines. There'll be more of them. Um, actually, the UK is due to um, approve an siRNA based medicine to reduce cholesterol. Um, and the materials that it, all these types of um, advanced therapies use are lipid based uh, materials, so lipid nanoparticles. Um, and I mention those because um, for systemic delivery, which is how patisiran is delivered, they're very good for liver delivery. They tend to accumulate in the liver. Um, and for vaccine applications where you're doing a direct injection intramuscularly, um, it seems to be OK as well. However, if you're trying to target other organs through systemic routes, then these um, these materials aren't really the optimal ones um, for mRNA delivery to the lung. Um, and these are just the common components that you would see in these formulations. Um, we also use these components for our polymeric particles. Um, and number one is the uh, is the key difference um, here. So the materials I'll talk about today are polymeric um, materials based on the polymer class of poly beta amino esters. Um, so they've been extensively explored for DNA delivery in the past, um, and they're very useful in that you can change aspects of the polymer in terms of molecular weight, chemistry, topology, and whether you formulate with PEG lipid. Um, and you can change these in a modular fashion and then investigate what um, effect that has on um, gene delivery. Um, so they all have a basic structure of this diacrylate amine and end cap amine. And this tertiary amine along the backbone becomes positively charged and can um, condense negatively charged um, nucleic acid through electrostatic interaction. Um, and it's been found that for DNA, um, changing any one of these three components can have um, an influence on transfection efficiency. Um, particularly, this end cap group um, has been found to be critical for um, transfection efficiency. So moving forward, we wanted to see if um, these materials um, applied to messenger RNA this time um, also um, is influenced by the different chemistries of the PBAEs. Um, so we did an initial screen where we synthesized different PBAEs with different monomers, delivered that in vitro to A549 lung cells, um, mRNA encoding for luciferase and did a quick screen of, of bioluminescence. And we found that similar to the previous studies with DNA, we saw a, a large variety of transfection efficiencies between these different polymers. Um, and we're not quite sure exactly where the difference is happening, whether it's the polymers having um, a different um, influence over cell uptake, um, over endosomal release, or whether the mRNA is better to um, decouple from this polymer and actually be translated at the ribosome. So there's lots of different stages where the effects could be occurring. Um, and we are trying now to look into that in a bit more detail by using different techniques. One of them is to look at Sci-5 tagged messenger RNA. So we're looking at this fluorophore uptake in cells um, and then um, 
performing flow cytometry to see which cells are taking up the mRNA and which cells are actually um, producing the GFP protein that the mRNA encodes for. Um, and we're doing this in primary cells and in um, cell lines to see what difference, um, you know, the cell not um, um, proliferating makes. We also wanted to compare mRNA and DNA delivery. So I showed you earlier studies that have compared DNA delivery um, and the study that I just showed you comparing mRNA delivery. But we also wanted to know, um, do the same vectors that are good for mRNA delivery, are they also the ones that are, are good for DNA delivery? So we took a small subset of our um, monomers formulated them through um, microfluidic mi mixing with our PEG lipid, and we delivered both mRNA and DNA to um, HeLa cells in vitro. And we found that generally there is a correlation between those that are good for DNA um, transfection, um, also being optimal for messenger RNA. And one of the ones that we wanted to take forward was the last um, polymer, the DD90103. Um, um, with, mixed with the C12, which is this time, that's a hydrophobic alkyl amine. And we include that one just as an additional component so that it can um, interact with PEG lipid through hydrophobic interactions. And we find that PEG lipid is incorporated much better when we include, include this additional um, monomer. So the reason why we included that is we wanted to ultimately deliver this through tail vein injection systemically and we wanted to form stable um, pegylated particles. So we took the, uh, the DD90C12103 forward for um, in vivo um, systemic delivery, and we wanted to compare the DNA mRNA delivery. As I mentioned, in the HeLa cells, we saw that the two um, had similar um, transfection efficiencies. However, in vivo, um, it, was, it was a different story. We saw, you know, over twofold difference um, in protein um, bioluminescence uh, using the messenger RNA compared to the DNA. Um, so the chart on the left is the, the DNA um, delivery over time using the same vector and then on the right the mRNA over time. And we were surprised to see that the pharmacokinetics of um, bioluminescence was similar for DNA and mRNA with a peak occurring between 12 to 32 hours. Um, we were expecting DNA to um, you know, be transcribed and then translate for a, a longer amount of time, which is what um, some, uh, some people suggest. However, there's, a few, there's only a few studies that actually directly compare mRNA and DNA using the same vector in vivo, so we, we think this is pretty um, interesting in, in terms of um, why we might want to use mRNA as an alternative approach for protein um, production in vivo. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the amount of protein that pr is produced is much higher with the mRNA. So here we delivered um, 0.25 mg per kg um, for the um, tail vein injection. Um, and again, we were surprised. We thought that DNA would be transcribed to multiple copies of mRNA, which would then be produce more protein. Um, but we think this might have something to do with the fact that mRNA may be more effective in um, non-dividing cells. Um, so this difference between what we see in HeLa, which is a rapidly dividing cell line, and what we see here in vivo, um, we think could be potentially um, to do with that, but we'd love to um, investigate that further. Um, and actually this paper, I haven't shown it today because we don't have enough time, but we did do some um, uh, blocking, uh, cell cycle blocking assays to see um, if DNA is more affected by, um, you know, an arrest in cell division compared to mRNA, and we do see a higher um, influence. We also in the past have compared um, PBAE to lipid nanoparticles. Like I mentioned, lipid nanoparticles tend to accumulate in the liver. We chose CKKE12, which was when I was doing my postdoc um, in um, Dan Anderson and, and Bob Langer's lab. This was one of the lipid nanoparticles that was um, published um, and developed in that lab and had good liver transfection. Um, we delivered both uh, PBAE and this CKKE12 um, 
using telvein injection formulated them both with PEG lipid, but we see a very different distribution um, with the PBA being much better for um, lung delivery compared to um, the lipid nanoparticle. Um, and again, I haven't shown the data here, but we did do flow cytometry to try and um, establish exactly what type of um, cell subtype within the lung was being transfected. Um, and we found that endothelial cells were being were the major root, um, major cell type that were being transfected by this root. Um, and again, that might be interesting for um, conditions where you want to target the endothelial cells, such as um, pulmonary hypertension. Um, but moving forward and the bulk of my work during my postdoc was um, involved in um, developing um, vectors for nebulized gene delivery. Um, so obviously I don't need to go into detail about why nebulized delivery is interesting. It's, it's a local delivery. We think we'll see better um, distribution in the lung compared to other organs, uh, fewer side effects because of that. And also um, it's non-invasive and a, a, a a more patient compliant way of delivering um, drugs to the lung. And um, so one of the most investigated polymers um, for inhaled delivery, gene delivery, is uh, branched PEI. So it's been quite successful at delivering DNA to the lung in preclinical studies. However, because it's quite a large, so this is 25 kilodalton branch PEI, um, which is quite large um, and it is toxic, especially with repeated delivery. And lower molecular weights tend not to be very um, effective. Um, so our aim here was to um, look to see if PBAEs, which were also um, similar to PEI in that it's a cationic polymer, however it's degradable, and so we wanted to see if that would be a less um, toxic way of delivering um, mRNA, and we also had seen this efficacy in um, systemic delivery in lung cells. So for inhaled mRNA delivery, again, we um, tested a library of um, PBA um, polymers. We tested two different types. Uh, sorry, we tested a range, but we decided to take two different chemistries forward. One was the DD90118, which is at the uh, higher end of the scale. It was very well um, performing. And we took C32118 forward as well, which was towards the lower end of the spectrum, um, which wasn't very good at transfection, but we wanted to see our um, studies that we're performing in vitro. This difference in chemistry that we see for transfection, do we also see that in vivo? So we took these formulations forward um, and we concentrated them to 0.5 mg per mil. This is a um, concentration of DNA that has been used in human clinical trials um, inhaled delivery um, in the past, so we wanted to use the same um, dose. However, that means we had to concentrate our formulations 150 times uh, what we were using in our in vitro assays. Uh, we also wanted to use a vibrating mesh nebulizer, which is again one of the most efficient at producing a, an aerosol. So at this point, we needed formulations that were very stable. Um, this vibrating ne ne mesh nebulizer produces three micron sized droplets, which are um, optimal for lung deposition. But within those three micron sized droplets, we still needed our stable nanoparticles. And so we took those forward, our two um, PBAs that we had um, identified. And of course, they didn't work. They clogged the nebulizer or they weren't stable at this very high concentration. Um, so we had to go back to the drawing board and we looked at this um, branched PEI that was very successful for inhaled delivery in the past. And we decided to apply this um, branching um, structure to our linear PBAEs. So I mentioned that PBAEs, um, another thing that we can modify is topology. And we, we um, took advantage of that and decided to incorporate a third um, component here, a, an amine that um, produced dendritic units within the polymer. We didn't want to just change the um, polymer chemistry. Uh, one other appro alternative approach we could have done is um, produce polymers that were more aqueous, um, more soluble in aqueous media so that we could concentrate the formulations for nebulized delivery. But because of our previous studies showing that um, chemistry is important, we didn't actually want to change the, the monomer chemistries. So rather than changing anything, we just introduced this third um, amine, which, as I said, introduced this um, dendritic region. 
And we were hoping that by doing that, we would increase the solubility of the polymer because um, dendritic polymers tend to rely on their end groups um, for polar binding with um, hydrophilic um, binding with uh, water to become more um, aqueously soluble. And then also um, the end groups, particularly for PBAEs, are very important for transfection. So we also thought that that may increase the number of these end groups in our um, polymer. So we went ahead, produced these um, hyperbranched PBAEs, and we compared them to our the linear counterpart. And we found that when we concentrated these formulations to 0.5 mg per mil that I mentioned we need for nebulized delivery, um, we found that these particles remained um, stable. So the dashed lines are the higher concentration. The red line is the linear and the black line is the um, hyperbranched. And you can see the da dashed red line, which is the higher concentration of the linear version. Um, they tend to form larger aggregates in this DLS that was performed, whereas the higher concentration of the branched polymers remain within the nanoparticle range. So that was one, um, you know, the stability at the higher concentration, we ticked that box. However, we still wanted to know whether after nebulization, the particles remained stable. So we um, perform nebulization and um, cryo-TEM before and after um, nebulization. And we found that again, the, the particles remained stable and were in this nanoparticle range. And we also performed another in vitro transfection just to check that by incorporating this third component, we weren't changing um, the transfection efficiencies and we confirmed that in vitro. We then went ahead and uh, nebulized to mice. So this was very um, non-invasive, just ambient breathing. The mice weren't, um, um, what's the word? Um, put to sleep, I can't think of the word. Um, and um, we found that very, um, very interesting was that the two different chemistries, the C32 and the DD90, and we did see that the chemistries made a difference in vivo as, as we found in vitro. Um, so we think that there is some kind of um, chemistry influence happening here, either the cell interaction uptake or the endosomal escape or all of the other things I mentioned earlier, we still need to investigate that further. Um, however, we don't think it's gross physical properties. Both of these particles have um, similar um, nanoparticle size and similar charge. Um, and they obviously um, condense the mRNA in a similar way as well. We also see very nice um, local distribution in the lung. And we don't see any other distribution in other organs, um, which uh, we were seeing some of that with the systemic delivery. It was um, found that um, the distribution was very uniform throughout the lung, which is to be expected with inhaled um, drugs. And also we then went on to characterize the um, subtype of lung cell that was being transfected by using this AI14 reporter mouse model. And here um, each cell in the mouse is flanked with this um, stop codon um, around this TD tomato gene. The gene is not produced because this stop codon is in place. However, in this model, we did, we nebulized mRNA encoding for Cree recombinase. And so if the cells were able to produce this Cree recombinase protein, i.e. translate the mRNA, then it was able to then chop out this stop codon and produce the red fluorophore, which is what we found in, in the lungs of these mice that were nebulized with um, the mRNA encoding for Cree recombinase. We then took those lungs, disassociated them, um, performed flow cytometry with markers for epithelial, endothelial and immune cells. And we found that the majority cell subtype that was being transfected was the epithelial cell population, which is in contrast to the um, systemic delivery. So again, this delivery route gives us an alternative approach to targeting a different cell uh, population within the lung. And this epithelial population may be interesting for diseases um, that have um, an epithelial um, uh, pathology, including um, cystic fibrosis, um, and asthma, and IPF, um, where epithelial repair is um, is um, not functioning. 
We also looked at toxicity of the DD90118 um, polyplexes. Um, we found that there was no weight loss. Um, there was um, normal weight gain with the um, DD90 polymers. However, with the PEI, we did see a slight reduction in weight gain um, in the mice. Uh, we didn't see any altered liver enzymes and um, alveolar structure was normal in our DD90118 polyplexes. And this was after three repeated doses of our um, mRNA and PBA polyplexes. Um, it was also nice to see that this technology was um, taken by another group independent of us. They um, synthesized the DD90 hyperbranched polymers um, and performed their own nebulized delivery, this time of mRNA encoding for CAS13 targeting um, respiratory um, pathogens. And so um, they found that they saw very nice um, treatment of um, SARS-CoV-2 with this method. And so I thought I would just mention that to so show that this um, inhaled delivery has been taken forward for therapeutic um, application. Um, are we running out of time? I just can't see. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so yeah. OK, one minute left. Or? Yeah, so one, two minutes. OK, yeah. OK, great. Sorry, I'll, I'll rush. Um, these are the last slides anyway. Um, so th the other thing that I wanted to just show you towards the end of this talk is that um, we're very interested in the pharmacokinetics of mRNA, which is the other hurdle that I mentioned um, that we need to overcome. Um, so we do see transient protein production with a peak at 24 hours. Um, and we're trying to understand if we can increase the duration of protein production and also the magnitude. So I mentioned that we can um, modify these untranslated regions, which is what one of my PhD students is doing. And um, she's taken um, human beta globin untranslated region from that gene and basically copy and pasted it onto a luciferase gene and um, had a look at how that affects protein production in primary lung um, cells. Um, and we do see a difference in the amount of protein that's being produced when we add these UTR sequences. So that's ongoing work that I just wanted to highlight. Um, and then also, finally, um, we are interested in what is exactly happening to the lung cells when you do this repeated application of mRNA in terms of lung function. We need our lungs to breathe, obviously, so we are very interested in if we're delivering mRNA repeatedly to the lung, what does that do to our uh, tight junctions, which is um, marked by this ZO1 protein, and also um, differentiation of our basal cells in our lungs, which are very important to replenish um, lost epithelium um, every day, you know, when you inhale smoke or pollution. So we're also looking at that side of things as well. Um, so in summary, I hope I've shown you that PBAs are versatile for mRNA delivery and that um, for therapeutic application, we really need to look at the um, mRNA transcript as well as the delivery vector. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge my funding um, that I've received and um, previous um, collaborators and current lab members that have done this work. Thank you for listening. I hope there's time for questions. Thanks, Asha. Uh, yeah, we have time for questions. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? Either in the chat or put your hand up and... Yeah, uh, Nazila. Hi, Asha. Thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I had a question a little bit about the chemistry of the nanoparticles you're using and developing. Um, of course, you have these diacrylates that you use. Um, is it possible to comment a little bit on the type of polymerization uh, technique you're using and how are you controlling the size um, of, of these particles? Yeah, so that's another area. If I was a polymer chemist, that I would probably look into. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we're using Michael addition, um, which as you know, is not very controlled. Um, and we're using just different ratios of monomer. Um, so diacrylate to amine, we just are changing the ratio of those two components. Um, you know, as we approach one to one, we have much longer um, polymer chains. Um, and if, if we have an ex a, a larger excess of the acrylate, we have shorter um, polymer chains. So that's what we're doing at the moment. And, you know, we've confirmed by GPC that we do see differences in our molecular weight distribution. Um, but that is one um, one aspect that there is a lot of ongoing research in um, developing better methods for synthesizing these PBAs. And what one is, you know, controlled living um, radical methods. 
Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I've, I've got one question, uh, Asha, uh, to, about the size, uh, specifically for the nanoparticles that you're delivering through the lung. So, you know, obviously, you know, when you're working with, you know, anti-cancer agents that you're delivering intravenously, you want to sort of be 100, 200 nanometers. Do the same sort of size constraints apply for delivering for, through the lung or can you get away with using larger particles, even micro particles? We, yeah, we found that using around um, 100 um, to 150 give, gives us um, optimal um, uptake. Um, we do see slightly higher distribution of particles in immune cells, for example, if you go much over 150 to 200 nanometers. Um, so, I mean, if you, if you want to do that, that's great. But for epithelial um, transfection, we try to stick within that range. Yeah, OK. And then the other question I had is, you know, when you talk, you know, when you see schematics of the nanoparticles for RNA therapies, they're basically like lipid, solid lipid nanoparticles and not liposomes as such. Yeah. I mean, is there a reason for that? You know, it, have people tried just encapsulating RNA into an empty vesicle? And is there a reason that's not, you know, the done thing? Yeah, so I showed that, you know, the two, two or three um, RNA based medicines that have been approved and they are all based on these solid lipid nanoparticles. I think um, it's to do with the fact that some of these genes can be pretty large. So with sRNA, I, I guess maybe liposomes could work. Um, but with mRNA, um, mRNA is pretty big um, and you need something to actually condense the um, nucleic acid material, not just encapsulate it. Um, so it, you do, you know, with the electrostatic interaction, that does help to make these particles smaller. Cool. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Asha. That, that was, that was a, a very interesting talk. Thanks. OK, so um, next up we have uh, Rongjun. Rongjun Chen. Um, Thank you, Yuval. Hey, Rongjun. So uh, Rongjun is a, uh, a reader in uh, chemical engineering at Imperial. Um, he, his research focuses on the development of polymer and lipid-based systems for toxic drug delivery vaccine delivery and storage, cell and gene therapy, cancer theranostics, and thrombolytic therapy. Uh, Rong Jun did his PhD and postdoc at Cambridge University in Nigel Slater's lab. And then he started his tennis track academic position uh, as a, a, a senior translation uh, fellow in Leeds in 2009. And then he moved to Imperial uh, in 2013. So uh, Rong Jun, uh, over to you. Thank you, Yuval. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Wait a minute. Uh, thank you, Yuval, and also many thanks to the committee uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Rongjun Chen from Imperial College. It is my pleasure to uh, give you a brief introduction of our recent work on protein delivery using lipsomes for targeted thrombolytic therapy. The research interest in my group focuses on biomaterials engineering for targeted delivery of various therapeutic agents. We are particularly interested in the development of biomaterials to mimic biological molecules, um, such as multifunctional sequence defined um, polyesters or polyesters and also the viral peptide mimicking pH responsive pseudopeptides for uh, cross membrane delivery and those endosome escape. Uh, we are also interested to, to develop virus mimicking nanovesicles to mimic the structure of a virus for intracellular delivery of uh, different uh, uh, payloads, including proteins and nucleic acids. Through controlling biomaterial cell membrane interactions, we can achieve efficient cross-membrane delivery into target cells, and also we can achieve targeted delivery to uh, 3D cell aggregates and uh, also um, blood clots, which I'm going to talk about uh, in today's lecture, uh, today's talk. Um, we are also interested to deliver molecules into organs or um, animal models. I will introduce our recent work on engineered nanomedicines based on lipsomes for targeted thrombolytic therapy. 
the formation of blood clots can cause serious thrombotic diseases, including heart attack, ischemic stroke, and pulmonary embolism. For example, it has been reported that one in six people in the world will have will suffer from a stroke in their lifetime, and about 11.9 percent of all deaths around the world were caused by stroke. And recently, the Nature article reported that uh, uh, blood clots have been observed as one of the characteristics of advanced COVID-19 infection, and the rate of dangerous clotting in patients hospitalized uh, with coronavirus has been reported to be uh, to be as high as about 20 to 30 percent. The main components of a blood clot consist of red blood cells, um, platelets, and the fibrin. One of the currently available clinical strategies is intravenous injection of a, of a drug called the TPA. This TPA is a, is a protein drug to quickly lyse the fibrin as part of the clot so that you lyse the blood clot and re-establish re the blood flow in, uh, in the body. However, only about 5% or maybe less percent, uh, less than 5% of patients can actually benefit from TPA treatment. This is because TPA has a very short half-life in the body. It is about uh, two to six minutes. Uh, after that, it will be removed by the body quickly. It can also be inactivated by circulating inhibitors in the, in, in the blood circulation. It has low specificity to clots and it has poor stability. And it can cause uh, some really serious hemorrhagic side effects if you want to increase the dose of TPA to lyse some difficult clots, for example, for the uh, stroke treatment. So there is a clinical need to address those issues using targeted delivery formulations, which I'm going to talk about. People in the research fields have, done, have come up with a number of different solutions. Some researchers have reported the use of a covalent conjugation approach, and they can conjugate uh, some drugs like TPA or some other similar drug uh, to lyse the fibrin by uh, the conjugation through cleavable linkage like a peptide. But direct conjugation can reduce the biological activity of the, of the uh, fibrinolytic drug. Other researchers have reported the use of PLGA-based nanoparticles through the high stress, the high stress caused by the arterial narrowing. TPA can be selectively delivered to obstructed blood vessel, but it, it seems difficult to be uh, clinically translated to to, 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 um, to the uh, thrombolytic therapy. And this paper was published uh, um, in, 2000, uh, in, 2000, uh, in uh, 2012, about nearly 10 years ago. Some other targeted systems have been developed by using magnetically activated nanomotors to improve the transport of the TPA to the surface of a clot. I, I, again, it is difficult to apply such systems in general clinical settings. So is it possible to develop some nanomedicine which can be easily translated, more easily translated to the clinic? So we, we have recently developed uh, um, some um, liposome-based nanosystem to mimic uh, um, how fibrinogen works in the blood color formation. As you can see in this figure A, um, Platelets play a crit critical role in the blood clot formation. And during this process, platelets will be in an activate, in an activated state, in an active state, with alpha 2 b beta 3 integrins abundantly expressed on the activated platelets. And this conformational change from inactive alpha 2 b beta 3 to active uh, uh, alpha 2 b beta 3 
can, can allow specific binding of activated platelets with the, the main, uh, main ligands of the uh, fibrinogen so on, uh, in the two chains of the fibrinogen. And this leads to the bridge, so-called bridging effect. So that means the activated platelets are bridged by the, uh, this, this interaction between fibrinogen and uh, uh, alpha to B beta three integrins. This is a process involved in the uh, platelet aggregation, inspired by this bridging effect between the fibrinogen and the activated platelets at a clot site. And we have developed a fibrinogen mimicking multi arm nanovesicles based on the lipsomes to achieve targeted delivery to a clot site and then check the release of the TPA to lyse the clot efficiently. Using this approach, we can actually achieve improved therapeutic index because TPA can be retained stably in the blood circulation. And this is favorable for, for uh, thrombolytic therapy because using this system, we can have the targeted delivery of TPA to the clot site. And upon interaction between the, uh, the nanomedicine and the platelet membrane, there will be some triggered release of TPA within minutes. This design of the nanomedicine is simple. Basically, this lipsome is self-assembled and the surface is coated with PEG. And PEG is conjugated with cyclic uh, RGD. RGD is a key motif present uh, in the chain of uh, two chains of fibrinogen. So we actually conjugate RGD, uh, cyclic RGD, with the con conformational restriction. The cyclic RGD, I believe it has CRGD, has very high selectivity and affinity with the activate activated platelet through the active alpha to B beta 3. The multifunctional lipsomes were prepared by lipid film um, uh, lipid film hydration followed by the extrusion. And this is the standard, pro standard procedure people use to prepare lipsomes. The nanoparticle size was around uh, um, 150 nanometer, and this is monodispersed. As you can see that the, the zeta potential had the uh, negative, negative values, showing that uh, the surface is negatively charged. And this negative charge is favorable for elongated blood circulation of the nanosystems. As you can see in this figure, so after the, the, nano, the nano vesicles with the coated uh, PEG or PEG CRGD uh, had a much better stability uh, during the storage and uh, no drug leakage during the storage either. And this is so much better than the um, lip zones without uh, surface coating with PG or PG CRGD. We first examined the binding behavior of the nanovesicles containing the uh, FITSI labeled uh, TPA. So we fluorescently labeled the TPA with the FITSI dye. Uh, so this was the, the confocal images shows that uh, um, when the resting platelets were cheated with the nano vesicles. You can see that uh, no matter if the vesicles with or without the CRGD, we didn't see fluorescence uh, associated with the activate uh, with the with the platelets. But when the human activated the platelets were cheated with the nano vesicles, you can see the, the distinct difference between the nano vesicles with without uh, CRGD ligands. So you can see that the nano vesicles. TPA, CRGD, PEG, uh, and the, this nanovesicle with CRGD ligand, you can see very efficient uh, association uh, uh, of the nanomedicine with the, um, with the clot, with the platelet, activated platelet. And this was confirmed by the quantitative analysis using flow cytometry. This figure shows that we can actually maximize the uh, the affinity between the nanovesicles and the activated platelets by changing the, the number of CRGD arms. We call it multi-arm the nanovesicles, and the number of arms can be 
uh, optimized to have the op optimal uh, affinity and the targeting with the activated platelets and the clots. Then we used uh, a flow system in the microfluid device to look at the uh, thrombus targeting under physiological flow conditions. So you can see that uh, um, under the flow, the, 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 the thrombus or the, the clots can be visualized under flow uh, fluorescence microscope. But when the, the clots were treated with nanomedicine, nanomedicine without CRGD, you, you could not see much fluorescence. And this fluorescence came from the labeling of a TPA with FITSI. As comparison, you can see that uh, on the flow, if you cheated the, um, the, the clots with the, um, nanomedicine with CRGD, you can see very efficient uh, association of the um, nanomedicine with the, with a, with a clot. And the, in the clot, there are uh, a lot of activated, activated platelets. After selective targeting to human thrombus, efficient release of TPA from the nanovesicles locally at the clot site is, is crucial for effective thrombolytic therapy. And this figure A shows that uh, the presence of human, activate, uh, human activated platelets can actually trigger very efficient release of TPA from the nanovesicles with CRGD ligands. So you can see that the, the TPA release was very efficient, and much more efficient as compared to the nanovesicles without CRGD ligands. It is worth mentioning that uh, when the nanovesicles with CRGD coating, but uh, in the presence of human resting platelets without the activated, uh, um, without the uh, alpha 2b beta 3 integrins, you cannot see much TPA release. So this release is actually this is a controlled release, and this is triggered by the presence of the activated platelets. And this further consolidated the, the, the controlled release in the presence of active, activated platelets. You can see that the release of TPA was in response to, in response to the concentration of the human act, uh, activated platelets. Then we, we looked into the mechanisms controlling the triggered release of TPA from lipsomes. We used the threat analysis using the, um, the accepted road uh, labeled uh, P, uh, lipid, and we used donor, so the NP, MBD conjugated uh, PE lipid. So you can see that um, when the, the lipsomes actually were, were inserted with the lipids containing the acceptors and donors, you can see that um, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the NBD fluorescence intensity was reduced, right? So it, is, uh, it was reduced. But if we actually use some inhibitor, so this is an inhibitor, to inhibit, to inhibit the, the, the interaction of the alpha 2 b beta-3, then you can see the very, uh, the, the very significant increase in the fluorescence of the MBD. This suggests that this TPA release was induced by the uh, interaction between the alpha 2 b beta-3 integrins on the activated, activated platelet surface and uh, the CRGD. And this is actually, in, this involves the membrane fusion because the membrane fusion can lead to the uh, decrease in the fluorescence of the donor. Then we looked at the targeted uh, fibrinolysis of, uh, uh, of the nanomedicine because the TPA can lyse the fibrin. So we developed a human fibrin clot model as shown here. So these are the fibrin and we actually have the uh, different wells and we added uh, the nanomedicine in the wells. We look at the, the, the area of the rings lysed uh, by the um, the, the, showing the lysis of the fibrin by the nanomedicine. You can see that uh, the lysis of the fibrin clot using the nanomedicine containing the CRGD ligand was comparable to the free TPA. 
Then we looked at the thrombolysis under static conditions by developing the hero human blood clots. So we, we prepared the hero human clots in multi-well plates, and we added uh, the nanomedicine solution in the, uh, uh, in the hero human blood clots. You can see that um, when the clots were treated uh, with free TPA, you can see very efficient lysis of the clots. You can see the, the release of uh, red blood cells um, in the well. And we can actually correlate this to the um, human blood clot lysis percentage. You can see that uh, using the nanomedicine, we can reach the similar level of human clot lysis, nearly 100%. But you can see some lagging, right? So this lagging behind the, the free TPA, that was because the interaction between nanomedicine and the check the release would take some time. So you can see some lag, uh, lagging uh, initially, but the catched up, uh, this that catched up in later stage. Um, so the lysis was very efficient using the nanomedicine. Compared to the to the nanomedicine without uh, CRGD ligand, you can see the lysis uh, capability was much lower. Uh, so this uh, without CRGD, the lysis behavior was not as good as the nanomedicine with CRGD. And this lysis was not due to the components of the nanomedicine, as you can see in this figure. If you look at this uh, video, let me see if you can see that. Um, If you can see that uh, um, the, the clots actually labeled with green and red dye. You can see that uh, very quickly the clot can be lysed. The green shows the presence of the platelets, activated platelets, and red shows the fibrin. You can see that uh, when the clots were treated in the flow conditions, physiological flow conditions, with the um, nanomedicine with the targeting ligand CRGD, after a few minutes, you can see the clot start to be uh, disassociated. And after 10 to 12 minutes, the clots completely disappeared. Uh, compared to the, to the negative control, this is uh, CRGD, PEG, uh, NV, this is without uh, uh, TPA. Without, uh, so this is without TPA, you can see the clot still there, right? And co as compared to the nanomedicine without CRGD, you can see that uh, after 12 minutes, still you can see the, the clots there, but some lysed already, but uh, most uh, clots still there. We did a quantitative analysis comparing the, C, uh, the nanomedicine with without CRGD, and uh, 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 compared to the, uh, to the, to the um, free TPA also. So you can see that for the nanomedicine lo loaded with TPA, with CRGD, we can have very efficient human blo uh, blood clot lysis, much, so much more efficient as compared to the nanomedicine without CRGD ligands, and also compared to the, to the, uh, nanomed the, the, the vesicles without uh, TPA loading. And this um, time required for, com for complete removal of the clots involving the use of the nanomedicine was comparable to the free TPA. And that is amazing because this in the flow, this in the, uh, in the flow system, that is a circulation, this perfusion system. But if you apply the nanomedicine in the blood, uh, circulation in the body, uh, the TPA would have a lot of disadvantages, right? Um, but nanomedicine can have targeted delivery to the clots. Um, in summary, we have successfully prepared uh, some new nanovesicles in, uh, based on lip, uh, lipids to have efficient TPA loading. And this nanomedicine can have efficient targeting to activated platelets and to also to the clots under static and also under flow conditions. Upon interaction between the nanomedicine with the activated platelets or the, the clot, uh, the, the rapid and efficient release of the TPA would take place within minutes. And that would lead to the complete cloud lysis, both under static and the flow conditions. I would like to thank uh, those people in my group, especially uh, Yu Huang, who did the most of the work. And also uh, Michael and Nikki, they, they, they are doing some, some work in the, uh, on this project too. I would like to thank those uh, people at Imperial College, um, uh, Xiaoyun and uh, 
um, Yun and the Boren, they, they are also in chemical engineering department. Simon, Isabel, uh, Michael, and Kirk, they, they are in medicine. Um, they are also calling from NIBSC and Alan from UCL. Thank you for uh, the funding from those funding bodies. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rongjun, for a fantastic talk. Um, are there any uh, questions from the audience? Uh, I've, I've got one question, if no one has a question. Um, you know, so, so you know, the principle is that you have your nano vesicles, which are linking up multiple platelets. Do you have any, you know, when, and when you say you, you see fusion events, do you have any idea you know, does it fuse to one platelet or multiple? I mean, is this something you can track with your threat assays? Um, we don't know how many active uh, activity platelets can be linked uh, by the um, lipsomes. Actually, we don't care about the number. We actually, uh, we were inspired by the bridging effects because the multi-arm platelets, uh, multi-arm um, nanovesicles, is, uh, due to the interaction between the CRGD and the, um, the integrins would play a role here. Why we want to have multiple arms? Because we want to enhance the chance of the affinity, improve the, improve the selectivity and affinity. Um, the important uh, characteristics we care a lot about is the interaction, how, in, how efficient the interaction between the lipsome membrane and the platelet membrane, because this uh, interaction would lead to the fusion between the uh, lipsomal membrane and the activate, activated platelet membrane. And this fusion would lead to the controlled release of TPA. Okay. And, and what's the lipid composition of your particles? Are they, you know, do they contain fusogenic lipids or are they just regular? Uh, just know? regular, regular um, phospholipids. Okay. Are there any other questions? If not, thank you, Rongjun. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you.